أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين نبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن يوق شح نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Respected elders, sisters and brothers Salamun alaykum alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh This man was a companion of the Holy Prophet of Islam who gave two sons for the love of Imam Ali alayhi salam. A sahabi loyal to Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. And indeed an individual who is referred to with his father as an example of generosity and indeed nobility. Adi ibn Hatam al-Ta'i is one of the latter Sahaba of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam and one who stood firm in support of the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace and blessings be upon him. He was the leader of the established Al-Tay tribe in Arabia and his father Hatam al-Ta'i generally known as the most generous Arab who lived at that time to the extent that Hatim al Ta'i is used as a barometer, as an example of generosity and magnanimity. Now, his father, Adi's father, Hatim, was the head of the tribe and also a very well known poet as well. His tribe lived in the modern city of Al Ha'il in the northwestern part of modern day Saudi Arabia. Yet, his iconic remembrance is mainly by the stories of his extreme generosity, as some have called it. For example, Hatim al Ta'i once was asked, has, Is there anyone more generous than you? He said, Yes. Once I was invited by a young man from the tribe of Ta'i, and I went to his tent, and he came and presented me with the head of a sheep. So I very much enjoyed eating it and the fact that he saw me enjoy it he bought me another and another and another until I had completed 10 heads of the sheep. Then I looked at him and said this was indeed very delicious by Allah and what had happened was that that particular young man only had 10 sheep that was all his possessions and he had sacrificed it all Right? And when Hatim al Ta'i recognized this, he said, Why did you do it? He said, Ya Subhanallah, you love eating something and I become stingy over it? They told him, Hatim, how did you reply or reward him? He said, I gave him 300 red camels, very expensive, each red camel, and 500 cattle. But he is more generous than me. They said, Why? He said, because he gave me everything that he owns. I did not give him everything that I own. And this was very interesting as a behavior of Hatim al Ta'i. His generosity was his second nature. And he believed that God the Almighty will indeed replace and give him more than what he actually has. He used to say to his servants, keep the fire uh, alight. You know, so that anyone looking for food will come to us. And if they do, if we get people coming for food to our house, then you are free for the sake of God. And this very important quality of generosity is a virtue praised in the Holy Quran and in the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Holy Quran, in 12 places, talks about people who are muflihun, successful individuals. And amongst those in chapter 64, verse number 16, Allah says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا 
as much as you can be God conscious. وَاسْمَعُوا وَأَطِيعُوا وَأَنْفِقُوا خَيْرًا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ Make sure you listen, make sure you obey, and give generously because it's good for yourself. Then he says, وَمَنْ يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Anybody who overcomes the kind of um, stingy, miserly nature of themselves, they are indeed the successful ones. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam would come forward and say, As-Sakhiyu, as narrated, As-Sakhiyu qareebun min Allah, qareebun min al-Nas, qareebun min al-Jannah, ba'idun min al-Nar. The generous individual is close to Allah, close to the people, and close to paradise. But they is, they're far from one thing, far from hell. Wal-Bakhil, the miserly, the stingy, ba'idun min Allah. بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ بَعِيدٌ مِّنَ الْجَنَّةِ وَقَرِيبٌ مِّنَ النَّارِ The individual who is stingy and miserly is far away from God, is far from people, people don't like them, and is far from Jannah, but they are very close to Jahannam. And in another narration, he talks about generosity being one of the various magnificent trees of paradise. He says, if you are generous in dunya, part of the branches of that tree in Jannah, yes, you begin to hold on to in this world, yes, which will lead you towards paradise. And that is why you find that the Ahl al-Bayt were indeed the most generous, were indeed the most magnanimous. They would give for the sake of Allah, but they would give willingly. لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا. Yes. An Amir al Mu'minin wa Mawla al Muttaqin Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa comes forward in this beautiful statement. He comes forward, he says, عجبتو للشقي البخيل. I'm surprised over somebody who is miserly, who is stingent. يتعجل الفقر الذي منه هرب. They are running away from poverty in this world because they want to keep their wealth to themselves, thinking that they will not be po uh, in the state of uh, you know, destitute, destitution. But they are actually becoming more and more poor. They are actually missing out from being a rich individual. In this world, they live the life of poor people. You know why? Because they're constantly saying, I'm not spending on this. I don't want to splash out on this. I, I, you know, I don't have enough money. So it's as if they are poor. Allah says, they live in, uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, that they live in this world like poor individuals. But in Akhirah, their accountability is of the rich individuals. So they miss out on both worlds. And that is why when it comes to this notion of shuh, the Quran says, وَمَنْ يُغْعَقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ This is worse, yes, than being miserly or stingy. This is when you actually um, look at what people have and you wish to have that whichever way possible, halal or haram, yes? You just want to take it and keep it only for yourself. Not only are you miserly, but that's what the Quran comes forward and says, if you're able to defeat this, then you are of the successful individuals. Because being generous increases the love and the affinity of people towards that particular individual. It also, according to narrations, increases the rizq, yes, and uh, indeed gets us closer to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of those individuals who are indeed generous was Hatam al-Ta'i. And after his death, his son, Adi, became the chief of his tribe of Attai, and then traveled towards the Roman lands, example in Sham, to somehow, you know, investigate other religions. And after meeting the priests there, he left worshipping of the idols and embraced the religion of Christianity. So Adi ibn Hatam al-Ta'i, the leader of the Attai tribe, in Arabia becomes a Christian individual. Now the Roman Empire had a plan. They wanted to consolidate their presence in Arabia and Peninsula. Therefore they wanted the Christians whom they trust to be present in order for these individuals to 
to be able to be their spies, their agents, their people to consolidate their strength and power in that region. And so, Hat, uh, Hatim, Adi ibn Hatim al Ta'i became one of those individuals. Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam knew the dangers and the possible consequences of not acting fast to stop this particular meticulous plan by the Romans. Therefore, he headed, he sent an army headed by Imam Ali alayhi salam towards the area of Attay in the year 8 after Hijrah. Yes, this is where the Holy Prophet was in Medina. He established the Muslim state there. And Imam Ali alayhi salam conquered that particular land successfully. And what happened was Adi ibn Hatim, the head of the tribe, ran away. And he escaped to Sham, to the Romans, and he took his family with him. But he had forgotten somehow to take with him his sister, Safana bint al-Hatim. And Imam Ali alayhi salam took her and she was taken towards Medina. Now, it was known that Safana was a very well-spoken, respected figure. And when Imam Ali السلام, brought her back, as well as the booties of this particular conquest, she was placed in a house with the other ladies, and she was respected because she was a daughter of a head of the tribe, the daughter of Hatem. She's now the sister of a head of the tribe as well. Once she saw the Holy Messenger, Rasulullah and after being advised by Imam Ali السلام, to speak to the Holy Prophet regarding her case, she did so. You know, she said to him, Ya Rasulullah, Halak al-Walid, my father is dead. Waghab al-Wafid, the one who protects me is gone. Famnun alayya man Allahu alayk. Have an obligation over me. In other words, release me. May Allah, you know, give you and, you know, shower you with blessings. So the Holy Prophet said to him, Who is your protector? She said, Adi ibn Hatim. He said, Al-Far min Allahi wa Rasulih, the one who ran away from Allah and his messenger. And then she became silent. So the Prophet of Islam commanded that um, uh, she is freed. Not only did the Prophet free her, but gave her wealth, honored her, gave her a sense of dignity, yes? And said to her, if you wish to stay here, then you are welcome. If you wish to go, then you are free as well. She decided to leave Medina and she made her way towards Sham. She reached there several weeks later and what? And after a few days, she went to see her brother. She was angry. She said to her brother who? Adi ibn Hatim al -Tai. She said to her, may you be punished. You saved yourself and your wife and your family and your horses. Yet you leave me? Adi looked down on the ground and said, there is nothing I can do to explain what I did. Yes. Tell me, what happened to you? She explained to him her experience in Medina. So he asks her, how did you find this man? She said, I advise you to go to him. And I saw him, but he wasn't a king. You know, he was someone special. If he is not a prophet, then it will not harm you. But if he is a prophet, you will become the most happiest of individuals by following him. Subhanallah, sometimes, my dear sisters and brothers, those around us can be positive influences. You know, those words of encouragement, those words of optimism, those words of support means a lot to a lot of us, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, we have to be looking up and not, if somebody from our family or others come down, uh, come to us with a problem, not to make the problem even worse, to try and figure out ways to make them feel better. If certainly there are ways and there will always be, especially if it is to make them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all make mistakes. We all fall into the pits and the dangers of shaitan, the traps of shaitan. Yet sometimes we need to be picked up by those around us through advice, through logical discourse and discussion. And this particular sister of Adi was a positive influence upon her, upon him, because she saw how the Holy Prophet of Islam was generous and magnanimous. Remember, this family is known for generosity, but now they saw a man 
who taught them exactly what generosity actually means. And therefore, Adi ibn Hatam al-Ta'i decides to go to Medina at the end of the year 8 of the Hijrah. He arrived in the holy city of Medina and he went to see the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And when he saw the holy prophet, he introduced himself. He said, I am Adi ibn Hatam. And the prophet said, are you the one who has run away from Allah and his messenger? He said, I have another religion. The holy prophet of Islam says, I know about your religion, but you are somebody who is practicing something that is outside your religion. ar you know, seems to be a kind of a, um, a division of the Christian uh, faith. And the Prophet says, you are part of this particular sect or this group of people, Rukusi. So you do what is known as Mirba. You do a Mirba. What is Mirba? Mirba is that the head of the tribe takes a quarter of the uh, cattle of the animals and the best quarter they choose and this is not part of the teachings of the Christian faith it's not noth nothing that can be supported within this Rukusiya part of Christianity and this man Adi ibn Hatam was surprised he did not know how to answer this extensive knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Then the Holy Prophet recited for him this verse of the Holy Quran. اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهبانهم أرباب من دون الله. They consider their priests and their leaders, yes, lords beside Allah. So Adi said, Ya Muhammad, they do not take us as lords beside God. He said, yes, because you make that which is haram halal and that which is halal haram. You forbid and what you make permissible and that is how people consider worship isn't it they're like worshiping you then Adi said I saw the Prophet walk with me he went out walking notice how much time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would spend with this man he said when we walked we saw an elderly lady the Prophet stopped he went to speak with her yes and he answered her question she was weak and you know he gave her attention he gave her his focus and he fulfilled what she wanted and I saw her happy leaving that particular interaction then we went and we sat somewhere else when we sat he brought me a cushion something comfortable and I sat on it yes and I sat on this particular comfortable um, place and what happened was he did not sit on anything comfortable it was like you know just normal he sat on the ground and i said this is not something that kings do you know at that time they were used to being treated by people who are very very important as um somehow kings or rulers who would be quite arrogant who would uh, treat others as inferior but they were conquered positively by the beautiful akhlaq of rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam he was convinced and Adi ibn Hatam al-Ta'i became a Muslim once he became a Muslim he demonstrated his loyalty to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam you know quite quickly and the Prophet of Islam you know adopted a very smart very effective method and that is he then made him head of his tribe because, you know, when it comes to people who are tribal leaders, if they are from the same tribe itself, they're more likely to actually succeed, isn't it? Adi ibn Hatam said, you know, once I entered the Prophet's mosque and there was no space next to the Holy Prophet. There were so many people. And the Holy Prophet asked people to move so that I can sit next to him. Such was the respect given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam towards this particular individual and he knew about the generosity of the father of Adi Hatam al-Ta'i yes who of course had died before perhaps being introduced or before knowing about the religion of Islam and the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam indeed what happened was 
Adi ibn Hatim want to lead his tribe. His appearance, therefore, in Medina was very much limited. And that is why we do not have much regarding his interaction with Rasulullah. But he did arrive after hearing that the Holy Prophet وسلم, had left this world, something that indeed would have definitely saddened him, a cause for sorrow and grief. Yet it is recorded in history that he said the following when he saw the commander of the faithful, peace and blessings be upon him, Ali ibn Abi Talib, being dragged in the streets. He says, Ma rahimtu ahadan min al khalq. This is Adi ibn Hatim who said, li al I did not ever feel the sense to be merciful to anyone on that day. Then when I saw Ali ibn Abi Talib, when I saw him being dragged so that he gives allegiance. And of course, it is said that Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i established himself as a supporter and a loyal companion of the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace and blessings be upon him. He would be one of the narrators of the event of Ghadir, reminding people about the superiority of the Imam alayhi salam. And during the Khilafah of the first three Caliphs, what he did was that he would take part in some of the conquests and the battles, such as the uh, opening and the conquest of Persia, modern day Iraq, Iran, as well as Iraq at the time of the second Khalifa. And some people might ask, why? Why would somebody who is loyal to Imam Ali alayhi salam take part in these conquests? We have examples of, for example, Salman, Ruzwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, and others such as Khalid ibn Sa'id, and other companions of the Imam Amir al Mu'mineen who did take part in these particular conquests. Well, the answer is perhaps they didn't want to sit idle. It is likely that they were doing so under the direction of the commander of the faithful and also to ensure that they have some influence, that their voice can be heard if they completely not take part in anything that is happening for the sake of the Muslim Ummah. Yes, then maybe they will be sidelined and they will not have any influence whatsoever. But when it came to the support and the bay'ah to Asadullah al Ghalib, Sayyidina wa Mawlana Ali ibn Abi Talib, Salawatullahi wa Salamu alayhi, it was whom? It was Adi ibn Hatam al Ta'i, Ruzwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, who gave him the full allegiance together with his tribe. 13,000 of his tribe members took part in the Battle of Jamal. This is not something that is small. He would encourage them fight with Ali ibn Abi Talib. He is the man, he is the Imam. He is the individual that needs to be supported. But it was in Safin that he fought valiantly and lost one of his eyes in doing so, despite reaching the age of 80. Allahu Akbar. He was 80 years of age, fighting alongside Amir al Mu'mineen. And not only this, he lost two of his sons in the Battle of Safin who were fighting with the Imam. Tarif and Tarfa, their name was. And they became Shaheed. Yes? This was not something that Adi ibn Hatim would hold back. And after the martyrdom of Imam Ali alayhi salam, Adi became a great and loyal supporter of Imam al Hassan al Mushtaba alayhi salam and became disappointed when unfortunately the people let him down. He would come forward, history records how Adi ibn Hatim would come forward and say, Subhanallah, ma aqbahu hadha al maqam. How worst is the position of these people? Ala tujibuna imamakum wa bna binti nabiyyikum. Ayna al muslimun. Ala takhafuna maqtallah. Won't you answer the call of your imam? The son of the daughter of the Prophet. Where are the Muslims? Don't you fear the wrath of Allah? And his courage continued when sometimes he was teased and confronted by the likes of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Yes. Once Muawiyah asked him and says, Ma ansafaka Ali, qatala awladak wa baqiya awlada. Ali was not fair to you. He killed your sons, but he kept his sons. Adi, radhwanullahi ta'ala alayhi. Look at his answer. He says, Ma ansaftu Ali ya, idh qutila wa baqiyatu ba'dah. I was not fair to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He was killed and I'm still alive. Then he said to Muawiyah, be warned. 
the swords that fought you in Safin are still with us. And we would die, he would say, in flames would be easier for us than hearing any insults to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Once Muawiyah said to Adi, Sifli Aliya, tell me about Ali ibn Abi Talib. You're a close companion. You're somebody who indeed was known to be associated with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Tell me about Ali. Look at the words of Adi ibn Hatam al Ta'i. He would come forward and describe beautifully some of the characteristics of the commander of the faithful. He says, Kana wallah ba'id al mada wa shadeed al quwa. Wallah, I saw him, yes, as an individual who is visionary. He was strong, strong in his commitment. Fasla wa adla. He was elo eloquent in his speech. He was just when he. Yes, gives a judgment. That knowledge oozes and erupts from his sides. Wisdom oozes from him. It was not looking for this world and its bounties. He found his comfort in it in the night. We felt he was just one of us. When we call him, he answers us. When we come to him, he was the one who would be forthcoming. He was the one who would start off the conversation. And when we invite him, he would respond. He would honor the people of religion. And he would love to serve and help the poor and the destitute. That the weak never lost hope in the justice of Ali. The narration says that after Adi ibn Hatim would say these words, Muawiyah began to cry and then said to Adi, how is your loss and sorrow for not having Ali ibn Abi Talib? Adi would say, man waladha fi hijriha. I am so saddened. It's like a mother who had her son and it was slaughtered right on her lap. Yes, that the sorrow would never ease, that the tears would never stop. At the time of the 10th of Muharram in year 61 after Hijrah, Adi ibn Hatim al Ta'i was 120 years of age. Therefore, possibly the reason why he was not able to support. Sayyid al-Shuhada Aba Abdullah al-Hussein Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi Yet he reaffirmed, remained firm and resolute and in the path of wilaya until he left this world in the year 67 after Hijrah to be included amongst those who are of the companions of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba and Al-Husayn al shahidi bi Karbala. Peace and blessings be upon those individuals and may Allah be pleased with Adi ibn Hatim Al-Ta'i, his stance and indeed his generosity like his father and his loyalty and his determination to sacrifice and to give for the sake of Allah and indeed to be on the path of the Ahl al-Bayt. Let us not forget that sometimes we achieve greatness when we give from those and that which we hold daily. He gave two of his sons and he stood firm despite those around him that may have swayed to gain power, to gain recognition and to somehow be given something which was not his. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with Adi ibn Hatim al Ta'i. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salli lahumma wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala ahli baytah al tayyibin al tahirin.